From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Should your child be required to take a financial literacy course in order to graduate high school? That's one idea being pushed by General Treasurer Seth Magaziner, who also wants to go after student loan companies for predatory practices. Plus, overall, the stock market has been pretty good. So how's the state pension plan eight years after the fiery reform battle in 2011? And does he have his eye on taking over the governor's office in four years? Our guest this week on Newsmakers, General Treasurer Seth Magaziner. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the program, Eyewitness News reporter Ted Nisi. Treasurer Magaziner, it's good to have you back. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. Good to be back. I want to start with a big money project, and that's school construction. Uh, a lot of people remember this because they voted on a $250 million bond. Uh, East Providence just broke ground on the construction of a new high school. The eye-popping price tag on this high school is $189 million, and it's financed partly by that uh, bond that everybody uh, voted on. And I believe it's the largest school bond ever floated by yes. Rhode Island. Okay. I, first of all, I was just curious, of the $189 million, putting you on the spot, you might not know, how much of the school bond is actually going toward that project? Of the bond itself, I have to get you the exact number, but it's in the neighborhood of 15 to 20. Um, taking a step back, we did this because we believe that every child around deserves to go to a school that is safe and warm and dry and equipped for 21st century learning. We have school buildings that are literally crumbling all across the state. We had to do something about it. That's why it's good news that the voters overwhelmingly approved the school construction bond in the fall. The school construction bond is just one part of a larger school construction initiative. So with the East Providence High School, for example, which is going to be a terrific project, um, some of the funding is coming from the bond, some is coming from the city of East Providence, some will come from the state budget, uh, because the challenge of repairing our schools across the state is too big for the burden to fall in any one place. So anyway, in terms of where we are now, the good news is the bond is passed, the program's underway, and we are going to have a lot of activity starting this summer, school construction repairs all across the state. So far, 29 projects have been approved to get some of that bond money. Uh, there will be more to come. And it really runs the gamut. So there's urban school districts that are getting some funding, like Providence and Cranston. There were just some approvals for Foster Gloucester. Uh, so urban, suburban, rural. Uh, are there any communities, you say there are 29 approvals. Are there any communities that you are saying, no, that does not fit our criteria? Are you turning any communities yeah, down? Yeah, so it's not me. So uh, the school, I mean, you yeah, in the state. The state, yeah. So the, uh, the school building authority at Ride, at the Department of Education, has a series of criteria for the types of school projects that will get state funding, right? Um, and typically what happens is the communities will send the school building authority a notice saying, hey, we're thinking of doing a renovation to this school and then they will work with RIDE to develop a plan that conforms with the state standards and will allow them to get some state funding. That process can take you know, six months, a year, sometimes longer, we're trying to shorten it. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, so it's, a, it's sort of a process of give and take between RIDE and the school districts, but the good news is there are already shovels in the ground. The benefit is going to be statewide, and a lot of kids are going to benefit as a result. We get we get questions about this because there's a lot of money, and people yeah. see schools in their own communities, and they're wondering, you know, where's the money going? What's going to happen with it? How fast do you think the $250 million will hit the streets? I know each town will be different, and there can be construction delays, yeah. but, you know, how soon do you think you'll hit, I don't know, $100 million allocated, say? Yeah, so um, money is going to start to hit the street this summer, right? So East Providence is getting some. Uh, some projects that were already in process, like the Barrington Middle School and the Lincoln High School, um, the end stages of their projects, some of the bond funding is going to go to support those. Uh, there's a new elementary school coming in Smithfield, or a, a major renovation of an elementary school. So the benefit is, is already starting. Um, the plan was always to go back to the voters to ask for a second bond probably four years from now. I don't think that'll happen in next year's ballot, but probably the one after that. That was always the plan that was recommended by the School Construction Task Force. Um, and I think that's the timeline that we're still on. Do you Probably. think it'll be another $250 million? Do you have an yeah. idea of what it will be? That was the recommendation for the, from the task force that I co-chaired last year. Um, 
you know, we'll see where we are a year or two from now and if that number needs to be refined, but that, that was always the plan. But you don't have any doubt that Rhode Island will quickly allocate, have enough projects to allocate the first 250, the approved 250 million? W within the first four year time frame, yes. I think, I think we will um, have no trouble finding projects around the state because the cities and towns are really responding. The cities and towns know that this is important. And, you know, I mentioned already 29 projects so far. Uh, dozens of school districts across the state are working with RIDE now to have other applications processed. So I do believe that we'll have a significant amount of school construction activity in Rhode Island over the next few years and that um, a second bond, as was always the plan, uh, will likely be necessary in 2022. I want to talk about the pension fund. When we were doing the open to the show, I made uh, I wrote that the overall the stock market is performing pretty well, and you sort of I think groaned uh, <laughs> during the open of that. But hey, look, you yeah. like to talk about the ten-year outlook of the pension fund, and if you look at the stock market over ten years, ten years ago wasn't so hot. So relative to that, yes. it's performing pretty well. How is the state pension fund? So the state pension fund is stronger today than it has been in a long time. Um, we beat our investment return target the last two fiscal years, the 17 fiscal year and the 18 fiscal year, um, under the new investment strategy that we unveiled a few years ago. Not only have we performed well on an absolute basis, but also relative to our peers, to other state pension funds, our relative performance has been improving. We adopted new accounting assumptions for the pension system a couple years ago, which can be a little arcane, but is actually very important to making sure that we don't have another crisis like we did prior to 2011 again. And we still have some of the strongest transparency policies for any pension fund in the country. So the trends are positive. We're going in the right direction. We're doing the right things. And, you know, the last month especially, there's been a little turmoil in the stock market. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be helpful if the the president would stop uh, tweeting about tariffs. But, um, you know, again, relative to our peers, we're, we're holding up well. You know, I did look uh, today, because the pension fund probably to your, uh, your happiness has fallen out of the headlines, <laughs> where it used to be headline every day. But 12 years ago, it was $8.7 billion. Today, at the most recent time, your office reported it, $8.3 billion. Uh, it, for state employees, the shortfall is about where it was before the right before the Raimondo reforms happened. The funded level, 54% then, 53% then. When are people going to see actual signs of the pension fund, not just treading water, and I know you might say it would have been worse than this, but uh, yeah. actually starting to actually show improvement, see a real increase in the funding rate, see growth in the fund yeah. beyond where we were before the Great Recession. Yeah, so I'd say a few things. First of all, um, we made the decision to adopt more realistic and conservative accounting assumptions for the pension. So we lowered the investment return assumption, we updated the mortality assumptions. And again, that's a little arcane, but what that means is on paper, that means that the funding status looks lower than before we made those changes, but it actually means that the system is much more sustainable because the whole, the biggest reason that we got into trouble for to begin with was that we had been for years using unrealistic accounting assumptions. So we're determined not to make that same mistake again. Um, in terms of the outlook from here, I, I think you're going to see a real difference in the next, you know, five to seven years. We're already seeing some of the metrics improve a lot, like our net cash flows. That's the amount that we spend every year compared to what we get in contributions. That is improving already and is going to improve dramatically over the next couple of years. Um, and we've done all of this while paying out three and a half billion dollars worth of benefits since I took office. So um, the system is fundamentally stronger than it has been in a long time. Well, as Ted pointed out, the funds that 53% retirees were told uh, yeah. around the early 2030s, their COLAs, their cost of living increases would be restored when the fund reaches 80%. Yeah. Is that, the proje is that projection still on track? Yeah, and actually the project we just had our actuary in uh, in December with the latest round of projections and the date of 100%, um, the date of 80% are both projected to be the same date today that they were projected to be when the reform happened in 2011. So we're still on schedule to getting the fund to a healthy status on time. This morning, uh, there's a somewhat disappointing jobs report out. Every time that happens, gives jitters to everybody remembering yeah. what 10 years ago looked like. Uh, do, uh, you know, are you concerned that that could be thrown off if, if there is eventually, I mean, we've, this expansion has gone on a long time, if there is yeah. eventually a recession? So when you compare us to other state pension funds, we are 
more conservatively positioned and therefore better prepared to weather a downturn if one were to occur. Of course, we hope that the economy will continue to grow forever and the stock market will go up every year. Realistically, of course, there will be a downturn in the economy at some point, right? These things work in cycles. Um, but the way that we invest under the Back to Basics investment plan that we launched a few years ago is more conservative than the median state pension fund. We are a little more cautious, a little less aggressive. That means that we should weather a downturn better than most of our peers. Um, similarly, our accounting assumptions, again, that investment return assumption is more conservative than most of our peers. That also means that we will be less sensitive to a downturn. That was not the case, by the way, back in 2008. Um, we were not more conservative in how we invested or the assumptions that we used back then. So again, to me, a lot of this is about learning from the mistakes of the past so that they are never again repeated. We are more deliberate, more cautious in the way that we manage the pension system now and better positioned to weather a storm if there is one than most of our peers. Treasurer, the Providence Journal reported that Moody's Investment Services weighed in on that controversial continuing contract legislation signed by the governor earlier this year. Moody's warned that if the law, which Moody's states could give unions more leverage in contract talks, uh, it could put stress on city and town budgets and could result in a, quote, credit negative. Is that a concern for you? Well, we always pay close attention to anything that the rating agencies say or flag. Um, we talk with the rating agencies often, so we have calls with them regularly. We've actually uh, organized forums in Rhode Island where representatives of the rating agencies have come to meet with city and town municipal leaders. Um, I don't think that had been done before in Rhode Island. And we are always on hand to answer their questions, to hear their concerns. And so I saw this report, it just came out in the last day or two. I'm sure the next time that we talk with the rating agencies, we'll you know, engage with them on that um, and answer any questions that they have. Your name always comes up as maybe a potential run for governor in 2022. If, if you were governor, would you have signed that bill? Well, I know that when the governor signed the bill, she felt that it had some important differences from the version that she signed or that she vetoed previously, right? Mm -hmm. More flexibility for cities and towns, particularly around things like staffing levels. So I think that that makes this bill much easier for, you know, not only this governor, but a lot of observers to, um, to accept than the previous version. Um, look, at the end of the day, like it's done, it's signed, it's the law of the land. We are on hand in our office to answer any questions that Moody's or anyone else may have, um, but you know the governor made her decision, and uh, I think that decision is is here to stay. So, would you have signed it? You know, again, I, I was not as in the details of it um, as she was, but I do recognize that it was a very different bill than the one that she vetoed previously. Um, again, I was not involved in those negotiations, and I frankly don't know the ins and outs of the issue as well as you know she and the others who were in the negotiating room probably do. Um, but I do recognize that it is very different from the one that was vetoed previously. All right, we're going to take a break on Newsmakers. When we come back, our guest, obviously, is General Treasurer Seth Magaziner. When we come back, should your child take a financial literacy course to get a diploma? Stay with us. You're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my left, Eyewitness News reporter Ted Nisi. Our guest this week is General Treasurer Seth Magaziner. Ted? Treasurer, uh, as Tim mentioned earlier, people think you're looking or considering a run for governor in 2022. Will you admit it? It is not my focus. I, and seriously, I, I was just reelected to do a job. I didn't ask if you're job. focused on it. I said, are we, it's some, is it something you're going to consider? I'm, Maybe at some point, but I'm not spending a lot of time thinking about it right now. We've got a very robust agenda at the State House. I was just re-elected treasurer. I'm focused on doing that job, the job that the people of Rhode Island elected me to do. So we're focused on using the treasurer's office to help the economy, to help the financial stability of the state and Rhode Island families. That is my focus. You've run for statewide office twice, um, yeah. and you can be an analyst for us for a second then, since you have no, you're not really thinking about <laughs> yeah. in the future, apparently. When do you think candidates who want to see Kairos in 2022 will have to get serious about that. Hypothetically, Hypothetically. speaking. Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> After You don't think even through the next election cycle, through I, the 2020? I, really, I really don't know. I really don't know. <laughs> uh, there are a lot of other Democrats who have uh, thrown their hat into the ring, run for president. 
Are you doing that anytime soon? <laughs> yeah. No. Okay. All right. So <laughs> breaking I, news. No. Out of curiosity, I'm not going to ask I you. I'm the only one who's not at this point. Right. Yeah. So, but that election is before the one that Ted just brought sure. up. We're looking at 2020. I'm not asking you to endorse anyone, so yeah. don't get nervous. But is there anyone you're watching for president with interest? Yeah. You know, I um, I, I don't have a. I haven't decided who I'm going to vote for yet. Um, I think it's a strong field. Like there really are a number of them that I like. You know, they're coming out with interesting ideas. A lot of them have very compelling personal stories. Um, so I, I'm an undecided voter right now. Uh, what I will say to those who have a favorite already is don't try to sell me or anyone else by talking about how horrible all the other ones are. Like tell me why your candidate is the right candidate and why I should vote for her or him because of all the things that are great about them. I, I really want to make sure that as a party we don't make the mistake that we made I think four years ago and get so negative and infight too much that we come out of the primary beleaguered and not ready to take on Donald Trump. Um, so I, I really I, I like a lot of the candidates and I hope that it stays a positive issue-based primary, because I think that's what people want. Are any of the, you know, you're a statewide office holder and a prominent Democrat, are any, are you hearing from candidates yet? We're certainly in Iowa or New Hampshire, but is yeah. there any signs of them, uh, signs they at least come through for fundraisers in the summer and such? Yeah, you know, the, of, of the whole field, the only one who I know a little bit, who I have a little bit of a relationship, is um, Pete Buttigieg. Well, I was Pete. actually wondering, as two yeah, younger I, elected officials. I've met him just through different networks of younger elected officials, and, you know, he's great, he's very smart, um, he's, he's exactly in person the way he comes across on TV. Um, but I like a number of the other ones as well. So I, I don't have a favorite right now. He's the only one who I know personally a little bit. But, um, you know, I'm open-minded. And, uh, you know, again, I, I just um, I hope that a year from now, as a party, we're united behind whoever the candidate, she or he may be, and we're ready to take on Donald Trump and win the White House. Do you think the president stands a strong chance of being reelected right now? I, I God, I hope not. I mean, I, I, I think that... Um, if we as a party spend too much time and energy taking shots at each other, then yes, he could. And, you know, the Republicans, they're going to unite behind him. Uh, they've sold out a lot of their professed values uniting behind him. Um, but uh, we need to come out of this primary session, uh, primary election united. And so, yeah, I don't think we can take him for granted. Uh, but I will certainly work as hard as I can on behalf of whoever the nominee is to beat him because we need a change in Washington, uh, particularly in the White House. Working hard to pull out round for the Democrats this time, I guess. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right, let's shift, uh, shift gears. I, I brought it up going into the break. You wanna, uh, want to require students to take financial literacy courses in order for them to get uh, graduate high school, and they have to demonstrate a basic understanding of personal finance to get that diploma. How would that be assessed? So um, let's take a step back here. Uh, there's a lot of evidence that when students have personal finance education in the schools, it leads to better outcomes later in life. So when students have financial education, later in life they are more likely to have higher credit scores, lower debt, be less likely to fall into financial traps, and that is why 37 other states have a personal finance requirement in their statewide K through 12 curriculum. Uh, we are an outlier in Rhode Island by not having personal finance as a requirement in our statewide curriculum. So we believe that Rhode Island should join those other 37 states that these are, I mean, again, basic, you know, how to budget, how to save, how a credit score works, how bank accounts work. Uh, have that in our statewide curriculum, just like all these other states do. We, in our legislation, give schools and school districts a lot of flexibility in how to implement that. So proficiency can be access, assessed in a number of different ways. Um, we give districts a lot of flexibility in sort of how they schedule it, whether they integrate it into another class. Right, it might not be a standalone course. It could be Correct. part of a math class. Correct. Or something like that. And on top of that, we just announced this week that the United Way is going to be setting up a fund, if this legislation passes, where schools and teachers uh, can apply for grants uh, to fund the expansion of personal finance in their schools. So pro professional development, uh, classroom activities, that sort of thing. So teachers will be supported in this process as well. I want to go back to pensions, uh, but not the, the system you're in charge of, Providence, which you do keep an eye on, uh, partly because there's a pension watch board for the independent local pension plans. Mayor Lors has given up on his big idea of somehow using the money from the water to, to, to backfill the pension plan. And some people argue, some prominent people argue that Providence should just take now kind of a muddled through strategy. Just make the full maximum contributions to the pension fund, no matter how big it gets, that the actuaries ask for. That's all you can do, and you've got to do that for 20 or 30 years or something. And 
and that's the only plan. Do you think yeah. that's that's the best way forward for Providence with the pension crisis there? So I think that there is a, a problem with the Providence pension, and um, you know it's a nearer term problem than people realize, right? Uh, the cost, the annual cost of the pension system in recent years has grown at a faster rate than the city budget as a whole, right? And so there is a real challenge here. It actually, and, and I'm going to draw a quick analogy if I can. I was thinking about this today. It, it reminds me a little bit of where we were a couple years ago on school construction, where you know everybody kind of knew there was a problem. Nothing had been done for years. The numbers were big, you know, billion plus dollar, you know, cost to do something, and people, I think, were almost frozen by that and saying, "Well, it's just such a big problem, we can't even begin to know where to tackle it." And what we did in school construction is, is what I think should be done with with the uh, the pension issue in Providence. A bond? Well, no, no, <laughs> not that. <laughs> yeah, really. But what we did is we started by getting everybody together, making sure that everybody understood the true size of the problem and also the urgency of it. Made sure that everybody understood that a solution is going to not, you can't have a solution that falls on the backs all of one group or one place because it's too big. You've got to spread the responsibility and people have to step up, but above all they have to communicate, like talk with each other. This is not a math problem as much as it is a political problem. I think, you know, if I were giving advice, and I do, I, if I were giving advice to the stakeholders in Providence, I would say get together more often and talk about this with each other, not through surrogates, not through the press, no offense, but with each other. That's what we did on school construction, and we came up with a plan that was big and bold and is going to make a difference. I've done some reporting on the large number of Rhode Island sheriffs that are out on injured on duty status, collecting their full pay tax free. Um, and our investigation found that some of them are stuck in, in sort of a limbo. You have the state sometimes losing in court, so they're having trouble moving them out of IOD. And the retirement board says, no, they're not hurt enough to qualify for an accidental disability pension. So they keep collecting this sum for, you know, a decade. Yeah. Um, the union has proposed allowing a workers' comp judge to have the power to award an accidental disability pension in these cases, to knock them out of limbo. Yeah. What do you think of that idea? No, so in, in our management of the retirement system, our philosophy is very simple. If somebody is disabled, they should get a disability pension. If someone is not disabled, then they shouldn't. We have a very rigorous process where applicants for disability pensions have to see a range of different physicians that, that are independent of the system that we appoint. We um, go through a really significant vetting process. There are a lot of opportunities for appeal if someone is denied. And again, if somebody gets, you know, is disabled and the doctors all agree that this person, you know, is disabled as a result of work or what have you, they should get a pension. If they are not disabled, they shouldn't. And so if the problem that we have here is that uh, people who, you know, are not deemed to be disabled by this very rigorous process, uh, are you know still on IOD? Then I think it's the IOD system that needs to be reformed, not the retirement board. So your system. answer is you don't think that's a good idea. You don't think uh, judges should be uh, have the ability. Family, excuse me, workers' comp judges should have the ability. No, to I, I think that ultimately decisions that have a financial impact on the pension system should be managed by the board that has a fiduciary obligation to the pension system. Um, but again, we have a you know very rigorous system where. In order to get a disability pension, you know, you're, you're seen by independent doctors. The board is always defer deferential to the opinions of those independent doctors. If the doctors say that somebody is disabled and they should get a disability pension, they get that pension. If the doctors say they're not, then they don't. And so, to me, it, it's, it's, a, it's a fundamental issue of fairness, which is that people who are disabled should get disability pensions. People who aren't shouldn't. Do you support the governor's proposal to legalize marijuana? Um, you know, I think that it's a serious conversation that we need to have. The reality is that, um, you know, if you go to that recreational marijuana store uh, right over the border from Tiverton, uh, there is a line out the door every day, and a lot of the people in that line are Rhode Islanders. So we're in a place in Rhode Island now where we have arguably all of the negative challenges associated with recreational marijuana, but none of the benefit. So I think that the time has come to, as the governor proposed, take a serious look at regulated. She isn't saying take a serious look. She's saying yeah, legalize yeah, yeah. it. But she's also saying carefully regulated and the vast majority of the revenue that is collected going to treatment, health care, et cetera, 
um, and law enforcement in the municipalities. And so I think that her approach is the right one. All right, so 30 seconds left. You proposed 529 bucks to jumpstart a college fund for babies born on May 29th. How much yes. is the state out of money now? How many babies Nothing. were born this on was May 29th? A, this was a, uh, I, I think about a dozen, but this was a promotion <laughs> run by a, a third party uh, 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 company that helps us manage the system. So, so this you was think not, this was not it? state money. I got you, but there yes. were about a dozen babies born yes. on May 29th. And they all get the $529? That's right. So uh, people should target their C-sections next year, <laughs> May 29th. <laughs> not good advice. Yeah. Or adoptions. You can do it for or adoptions, adoptions, too. Good yeah. point. Good yeah. point. Yeah. All right, yeah. General Treasurer Seth Magaziner, thanks right. so much for joining us on the program. If you missed any of it, it's online, WPRI.com. And don't forget to sign up for our podcast through iTunes for Ted Nisi. I'm Tim White. We will see you next week on Newsmaker.